Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm still on vacation, and for this video, I uh, decided to film from my balcony. So you can see the ocean behind me, it's so nice and serene. I'm not supposed to be recording on my vacation, but again, I can't keep away from you guys. So I definitely decided to make a video for you guys. This is going to be another video on NCLEX topics, just important co uh, concepts that you need to know. And this is for both LPN and RN. These are concepts that you absolutely need to know. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Give it a thumbs up. You're gonna love the video. So go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And also guys, don't forget, I'm now offering uh, Next Generation NCLEX reviews. I'm offering one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. I'm offering consultation sessions all of those you can reserve your spot by going to my website nexusnursinginstitute.com and while you're there check out the audio lessons I have available for the students who are currently in the nursing program I know there are some students you're in the bind you have to get a certain um, percentage on your next exam to pass the course you have to do really really well I encourage you to go to my website and look at the audio lessons I have available and hopefully I have something that you're about to test on get that audio lesson listen as many times as you can and go over the concepts that I cover, okay? All right, guys, before we get started, as always, I want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, just go ahead and fast forward. You're not being forced to do so. If you are and you're not um, operating heavy machinery, please close your eyes and bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord, for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for another opportunity that you've given to us to go over this information, Father God. Lord, I pray for I pray for every single viewer, every single listener right now, Father God, for whatever reason they've come to this channel to learn. I ask that you please help them to be able to understand this information, Father God, and process it and be able to apply it the next time they're presented with this type of information. I pray not only for uh, the viewers and listeners, but the people who are supporting them and encouraging them. I ask that you please help them to do well on their exams I ask that you please help them to please give them energy and discipline to study as they need to study. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue doing. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, let's get started. First question. I got to be careful. It's windy out here. I don't want my papers flying all over the place. All right. First question. It says the nurse is assessing the function of a client's optic nerve. What is the most important equipment for the nurse to use during this assessment? One. Uh, finger to test cardinal signs, two, flashlight to test the corneal reflexes, three, Snellen chart to test visual acuity, or four, piece of cotton to test corneal, cor corneal sensitivity. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is three. We're talking about the optic nerve. So for the optic nerve, you want to uh, assess the visual acuity. Whenever you see visual acuity, you need to be thinking of the Snella chart because that's what is used to test for visual acuity. Next question. Oh, I'm turning. A nurse is caring for a client following surgery in the post-anesthesia care unit, that's the PACU. The nurse observes that the client is gagging on his airway and about to vomit. Which is the best position for the nurse to place the client? One, prone. Two, Trendelenburg. Three, supine. Or four, sideline. And guys, the correct answer is for sideline. So placing that patient on the side will help prevent aspiration. Um, choice one, prone, uh, putting them face down, that's not really helpful. Choice two, Trendelenburg, that's with the legs um, up, the head more down, that's not as helpful. And four, supine, putting them on their back. No, you want to have that patient on the side, it's gonna be sideline. Which nursing intervention would best help prevent UTIs for a client with an indwelling urinary catheter? One, recommend limiting fluid intake. Two, encouraging showers rather than bathtubs, tub bath. Three, open the drainage system to obtain a urine specimen. Or four, irrigate the catheter twice daily with sterile saline solution. And guys, the correct answer is to encourage showers rather than tub baths. So if you didn't know this, I'll tell you now, whenever it comes to tub baths, that increases your chances of UTIs. Whenever water or fluid is not moving, it's still, guess what, bacteria loves to grow. It's a perfect medium 
for bacteria, right? So tub baths automatically increases your risk for UTIs. This person already has a UTI and they have an indwelling catheter. Guess what? Anything that's inserted into your body increases the risk of any type of infection because once something's inserted into the body, guess what can be introduced? Pathogens. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, recommending limiting fluid intake. Absolutely not. If anything, you want to do what? Increase fluid intake. You want to flush out the bladder so when the patient urinates, any pathogens that was in the bladder, by the way, the bladder is supposed to be a sterile environment, but if there were pathogens in the bladder, you want there last to be you want for there to be lots of fluids so that they can be flushed out when the person urinates. So you don't want to decrease fluids, you want to increase fluids. Uh, choice three, open the drainage system to obtain a urine specimen. Well, you open up that um, drainage system, all you're doing is providing a pathway for the pathogens. That's dumb. Why would you do that? That makes no sense. So that's false. And then four, irrigate the uh, catheter twice daily with sterile saline solution. Irrigating the black, um, the catheter, that keeps it patent, but it doesn't help prevent infection. It just keeps it patent. So the correct answer choice, guys, is number two. Six months after the death of her infant son, a client is suspected of dysfunctional grieving. Which assessment would the nurse expect to find in this client? One, she goes to the infant's grave weekly. Two, she cries when talking about the loss. Three, she exercises four times a day and ignores her loss. Or four, she states the infant will always be part of the family. And guys, the correct answer is three. She exercises uh, four times a day and ignores the ignores the loss. So two things that are going on. Number one, exercising four times a day, that's overactivity. All right? You're you have doing way too many things, overactivity, why? To keep your mind off of whatever it is that's hurt, hurting you. So we have overactivity and the second part, ignoring her loss. That's not functional grieving because you have to go through that process. So um, um, all of this overactivity and just ignoring that loss, that's just a way of not experiencing those emotions and not working through those emotions. Now, uh, choices one, two, and four, all of these are normal responses. Going to the grave, crying when talking or thinking about the loss, stating that that infant will always be part of the family. Those are normal responses that we expect to see. A nurse notices that a hospital client has been crying. What is a nurse's best response? One, respect the client's privacy by saying nothing. Two, it seems like something is bothering you. Three, why are you crying and upsetting yourself? Or four, being in the hospital is hard, but try to keep your chin up. And guys, the correct answer is two, it seems like something is bothering you. So that's making a simple observation. Let me adjust this, okay. I gotta make room for the words. All right, that's making a simple observation, guys. And you making that simple observation, not saying anything else, that's allowing that patient a, a chance to kind of think about your statement and express themselves. You're not forming an opinion. You're not giving advice. You're making a simple observation. Now, and by the way, that's therapeutic communication. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, respect the client's privacy by saying nothing. So you're going to just ignore that nonverbal communication or that nonverbal cue. It says in the question that you walk in and the patient's crying. That is a nonverbal communication. You're just going to ignore that? Absolutely not. Choice uh, three, why? Stop right there. When it comes to therapeutic communication, you never ask why and you never ask what made you. So we know that's wrong. And then choice four, being in the hospital is hard, but look at this, try to keep your chin up. Uh-uh. In nursing and therapeutic communication, we avoid cliches, things such as keep your chin up, um, uh, there's a brighter day tomorrow, things are gonna get better, absolutely not. A nurse gives the wrong medication to a client. Which initial communication will the unit's risk manager anticipate uh, from this nurse. One, an incident report. Two, an oral report from the nurse. Three, copy of the medication record. Or four, order change signed by the health care provider. What do you think? 
And the correct answer is one, an incident report. A mistake was made, you expect an incident report. Now go back to the question because there's something I wanna point out to you. Look what it says. It says, what initial communication will the units, what? Risk manager. What is the job of the risk manager? The job of the risk manager is to identify uh, potential areas of uh, uh, areas that can of uh, things that can happen to the patient that should not happen. And so what the risk manager um, is supposed to do is to come up with solutions so it doesn't happen again. So we expect an incident report to be handed to the risk manager. That incident report is a third party communication. It does not go in the medical chart. As a matter of fact, there should not even be a mention there should not even be a mention of an incident report in the in the patient's medical chart. It's simply for uh, the organization. There was something else I wanted to say to you, but that bird distracted me. What else did I want to say to you? Oh, anyway, so with the incident report, it's not meant to penalize the nurse. All right. And so when a mistake happens, again, this is so that the facility can know what the mistake was and put measures in place so it doesn't happen again, so that nurses are encouraged to report any mistakes. We don't want to penalize them, otherwise they're not going to report the mistakes. So anyway, we expected an incident report to be given um, to show how future injuries can be uh, prevented or avoided. Now let's look at the other wrong choices. Two, oral report from the nurse. If it's not documented, it never happened. What do you talk about oral report? You can give an oral report later, right? But what is important is going to be that incident report. Three, copy of the medication record. Why would we give that to the risk manager? Again, the job of the risk manager is to help avoid um, injuries in the future. So they have to know what happened so they can put policies in place so it doesn't happen again. What's the medical record gonna do? False. And then four, order change signed by the healthcare provider. Are you crazy? No healthcare provider in their right mind is going to change your order to cover up your mistake. They're not gonna do that. They're gonna throw you under the bus. All right, but they are not going to change your order to cover up your mistake. That's not going to happen. So the correct answer, guys, is going to be number one. Next question. A student nurse witnesses a registered nurse performing a procedure on a client without obtaining informed consent for the procedure. The student nurse recognizes that the registered nurse is guilty of committing what? One, breach of confidentiality. Two, assault and battery. Three, harassment. Or four, neglect of duty. And guys, the correct answer is assault and battery. This patient did not give informed consent. So assault is the threat of touching someone against their will. And battery is following through with that threat. The battery is touching someone against their will. And again, patient did not give informed consent. So that's battery. Okay, now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, breach of confidentiality. That's, you know, violating, you know, HIPAA. That's giving out a patient's private information to um, someone that has no business of getting that information. They're not, you know, on the healthcare team. Uh, they have no legal standing. Choice three, harassment. That's, you know, annoying someone annoying someone, stalking someone, not leaving someone alone. That's harassment. And then choice four, neglect of duty. Neglect of duty is not doing something that you should have done. Not doing something that you've been trained to, you went to school for, you took a test for, you were trained to do something and you didn't do it. That is what neglect of duty is. A surgical client newly diagnosed with cancer tells a nurse that she knows the laboratory made a mistake regarding her diagnosis. Which reaction is the client most likely experiencing? One, denial. Two, inte intellectualization. Three, regression. Or four, repression. And the correct answer is denial. Go back to the question. It says that she says that the lab made a mistake. She's in denial. 
Two, intellectualization. So intellectualization would be that patient using all these big words and basically sounding like a medical or nursing textbook when talking about that diagnosis, right? So that is intellectualization. Three, regression. That is going back, your behavior going back in time, such as acting like a child. Repression. That would be an example of that, like if the patient if did not even remember being diagnosed, right? That would be repression. So they're pushing down the memory of something that was so hurtful to them. That's repression. Which statement made by a client about her two-day-old newborn indicates the need for further teaching? One, I'll trim the baby's nails when he's sleeping. Two, I'll remember to place the baby on his back when he sleeps. Three, our infant car seat must be placed in the back seat of the car. Or four, the first thing I'm going to do when we get home is to give the baby a tub bath. And guys, the correct answer is four. The first thing I'm going to do when we get home is give the baby a tub bath, a two day old. You cannot submerge, submerge that infant, that newborn, or give them tub baths, or get that umbilical area wet until that, um, uh, what's it called, the umbilical cord, until it falls off and it heals. So absolutely no. If they say that they're going to give the baby a tub bath, that requires further teaching. Choices one, two, and three, all of those are appropriate responses, but not choice four. A client who just gave a who just gave birth is concerned about her neonates Apgar scores of seven and eight. She says she's been told that scores lower than nine are associated with learning difficulties later in life. What is the nurse's best response? One, why are you worrying? Your infant is perfectly fine. Two, I understand your concerns. You should ask about placing your infant in for follow-up for follow-up diagnostic program. Three, you're right to be concerned, but there are good special education programs available. Four, APGAR scores are used to indicate a need for resuscitation at birth. Scores of seven and above indicate that the baby has no problems. And guys, number four is the correct answer. Seven and above, baby's good to go. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, why? Stop. Again, when it comes to therapeutic communication, you never say why and you never say what made you. So we know that's wrong. Two, I understand your concerns. That first part is actually therapeutic. That's wonderful. Let's keep going. You should ask about placing your infant in a follow-up diagnostic program. No, that's not necessary. The baby's fine. So you understand their concern, but you should have followed up with correct information by letting mom know that any score seven or above is good. So that's wrong. And I say this all the time, guys, because NCLEX will do this to you. They will give you a beautiful answer at the beginning and then there'll be a comma or a period and everything after is horrible. If the complete answer choice is not correct, it's all wrong. Get rid of it. Choice uh, three, you're right to be concerned. You're not right to be concerned. False. And four is the correct answer. Again, scores a seven and above, the baby's good. A prenatal client uh, tells a nurse, I've tried to become pregnant for the past 10 years, and now I have mixed emotions about the pregnancy. I feel guilty for my conflicting reaction. What is the nurse's best response? One, you need to talk to your midwife about these unusual feelings. Two, you're experiencing the normal ambivalence that pregnant mothers feel. Three, these feelings are expected only in women who have had difficulty becoming pregnant. Or four, let's make an appointment with a psychologist to help you sort through your feelings. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you think the answer is? And guys, the correct answer is two. You're experiencing the normal ambivalence that pregnant mothers feel. It's normal to be happy and excited about this pregnancy, but at the same time, to be nervous, anxious, scared. That is normal. Now let's go over the wrong answer choices. One, you need to talk to your midwife about these unusual feelings. These aren't unusual feelings, that's number one. And number two, what have I taught you about nursing, about passing the buck? You do not ever pass the buck over something that you can handle. Why are you gonna pass them over to the nurse practitioner when you can easily educate and talk to the patient? Don't pass the buck, so that's wrong. Three, these uh, feelings are expected only, stop right there, 
What have I told you about these all-inclusive words such as only, always, never? Stay away from them. Do not choose an answer that includes one of those words unless you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's your answer. And guess what? Usually it's not the answer. Moving on. Choice four, let's make an appointment with a psychologist. A psychologist for what? This is normal. So two is the correct answer choice. A client tells the nurse that her husband is behaving in strange ways since she became pregnant. He's having morning sickness, put on weight, reports intestinal no pains, and acts like he's pregnant. How does the nurse interpret this behavior? One, extreme anxiety. Two, a normal kuvad. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Right, kuvad or kuvadi. Let me know in the comment section. Three, signs of reaction formation. Four, abnormal and in need of counseling. And guys, the correct answer is two, normal. This is normal behavior. This, um, we see this a lot. And so this is how uh, the males, uh, the male, what's the word I'm looking for? Adjustment. That's how they adjust to the idea that they're going to be a father. So this is normal behavior, not extreme anxiety. Choice three, reaction formation. No, reaction formation is when you behave the opposite of how you really feel or you say the opposite of how you really feel. So if you cannot stand Professor D, you tell everybody, you know what? I think Professor D doesn't like me. You really don't like Professor D, but you're telling everybody Professor D doesn't like you, right? That's reaction formation. And then number four, abnormal in need of counseling. It's not abnormal. It's actually very normal. So number two is the correct answer choice. Next question. When assessing a client who just delivered a neonate, a nurse notes the following, blood pressure 110 over 70, Pulse 60, respiration 16, lochia moderate rubra, fundus above umbilicus to the right, and negative home and sign. What is the most appropriate nursing intervention? One, these findings are all normal. Two, have the client void and recheck the fundus. Three, turn the client on her left side to decrease blood pressure. Or four, rub the fundus to decrease lochia flow and prevent hemorrhage. And guys, the correct answer is two. Have the client void and recheck the fundus. Why are we having them void and recheck the fundus? Because when you see that fundus elevated and you see it to the side, you should suspect the patient has a full bladder, okay? And so that's going to be the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, these findings are all normal. No, it's not. It shouldn't be um, uh, over to the, fun uh, the fundus should be up and up over to the side. So that's wrong. Three, turn the client on the left side to decrease the blood pressure. The blood pressure is normal, 110 over 70. And then choice four, rub the fundus to decrease the lochia flow and prevent hemorrhage. They're not at risk of hemorrhage. Look, the lochia is, um, we're looking at uh, moderate rubra. <clears throat> moderate rubra. They just delivered. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the flow is normal. So the correct answer choice, guys, is going to be number two. You're going to have the client void, empty the bladder, then you're going to recheck them. A client with gestational diabetes delivers an infant weighing 9 pounds, 11 ounces after eight hours of labor and membra membranes that ruptured three hours ago. Which interventions would be appropriate for this neonate? Select all that apply. All right, guys. How do we treat select all that apply? We treat them as true or false. Let's go. One, obtain blood cultures for prolonged ruptured membranes. False. It's been three hours. It's not prolonged. How about choice two? Obtain a heel stick for glucose level. True or false? True. So these babies there are born to moms with gestational diabetes. Do you expect them to have hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? Hypo. We're concerned about hypoglycemia because what happens is they make, often they make too much insulin, right? And so their blood sugar can be low. So we're going to assess them for that. We're going to be very concerned about hypoglycemia um, in the newborn that um, was born from a mom who had gestational diabetes. Choice three, maintain a thermal neutral, neutral environment. True or false? True. Why do you want to maintain a, a um, what does it say, thermal neutral neutral environment? You want to decrease the risk for hypothermia. And to be honest, this is not only for the newborn that is newborn of a mom with gestational diabetes. That's across the board. 
Um, that is always a concern with newborns, but especially they're going to be at higher risk, the babies that were born from mothers with gestational diabetes. So absolutely, we want to decrease that risk of hypothermia. Choice four, allow the mother to begin breastfeeding the neonate in the delivery room. True or false? False. And I know what you're, because usually it's true, but remember the mom has what? Gestational diabetes. And so if the mom has gestational diabetes, what are we concerned about that neonate? Hypoglycemia. The mom's breast milk doesn't have enough glucose. All right. So um, that baby that we're concerned about having hypoglycemia, we're going to be trying to give them like a direct glucose source because it's not going to be the breast milk is not going to have enough glucose um, for that baby. So in normal circumstances, this would have been true. But because this was a baby that was born to a gestational um, diabetic mom, it's false. How about choice five? Monitor the neonate for respiratory distress. True. Why? Again, this goes back to mom having gestational diabetes. So mom has gestational diabetes, causes the baby to make a lot more insulin. They're at risk for hypoglycemia. Guess what um, is a secondary complication to that? Decreased surfactant. They're making all this insulin but the surfactant is decreasing. Remember, surfactant is what allows the lungs to open up for the baby to be able to breathe. So absolutely, they're gonna be at risk for respiratory distress, and we're gonna be watching out for that. So the correct answer choices, guys, are choices number two, three, and five. A 13-year-old prenatal client asks about getting fat while she's pregnant. The nurse tells her that due to her, her age, she needs to gain enough weight to reach the upper portions of her recommended weight to prevent, one, a delivery of pre premature neonate, two, a difficult delivery, three, delivery of a low birth weight neonate, or four, preeclampsia. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is three, delivery of a low birth weight neonate. So adolescent girls, and when I say adolescent, look, she's 13, very young adolescent. But excuse me, adolescent girls are at highest risk for um, delivering low birth weight uh, neonates. And it has to do, a lot of it has to do with their small size. So that's very important. You're going to teach her that she's going to have to uh, gain more weight. Last question. The mother of a neonate receiving phototherapy asks why her child has developed loose stools. Which response by the nurse would be accurate? One, they're abnormal and may indicate an infection. Two, they're, they're associated with adverse reaction to formula. Three, they're common when, re when receiving phototherapy treatments. Or four, they're abnormal and phototherapy should be discontinued. And guys, the correct answer choice is three, they're common when receiving phototherapy uh, treatments. And the reason for that, guys, is the breakdown of the bilirubin. That's what causes the loose stools. So you're going to teach the mom that that's normal, and you can teach her why as well. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, they're abnormal and may indicate infection. False. It's very normal when the child's getting phototherapy. Uh, two, they're associated with an adverse reaction to formula. It has nothing to do with the formula. And three, they're abnormal. Again, no, it's not. It's very common. Again, the breakdown of that bilirubin, that's what causes the loose stool. So that's what you got to teach to the mom. And guys, that is the end of the video. Now, before you go, please, if you haven't done so, if you haven't done so already, give me a thumbs up. Let me know what you thought about this video. And don't forget, audio lessons, NCLEX review, tutoring, consultation, all of those guys can be found on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also, um, almost daily, not now, guys, because I'm on vacation. So I'm not, besides these videos I'm making for YouTube, I'm not posting anywhere else. But you can go see my other videos. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys catch me on the next video.